Well, first of all, I want to thank Austin Geological Society for inviting Rob and me to present some of our research on the Austin Chalk. As Linda mentioned, the Austin Chalk has been one of my major projects over about the last five years. And it's been supported by the RCRL group in the Bureau. That's the um, Carbonate Reservoir Characterization Laboratory, where we essentially do carbonate research. And the other group supporting us has been the STAR program being run by, in the past, Bill Ambrose and now um, Lorena. But what Rob and I would like to do today is present some of our research on what we think is a very interesting section of the Austin Chalk. And this abbreviated title I put up here is the, our major topic, and it's essentially volcanic activated mass wasting complexes in the upper Austin Chalk strata. And this is very different than what most of the Austin Chalk looks like. So I always like to give a, a slide to show what I think is the significance of what I'm doing. Uh, it, and I put these several bullets. One is to provide an understanding of an unusual stratigraphic section, and I'll give you some stratigraphy in a minute. We call it the ACB1 unit within the down dip, deeper water Austin chalk. This is area away from the outcrops, because in the Austin for the production, the outcrops are not good analogs. You've got to go down dip into the cores. We want to show the relationship between volcanism that has taken place in this period of time and mass wasting complexes are directly related. And I want to present a sedimentological description of the mass wasting complexes that contain debrites, hyperconcentrated density flow deposits, slumps, and volcanic ashes. And I'll explain some of these terms as we go through. And one of the interesting things out of this, it answered a very simple question for me. Why was I seeing shallow water biota in the deeper water settings of the Austin Chalk? Okay, let's take first a look at the regional um, picture of the layout of the Austin. Here's North America. This is during um, the Upper Cretaceous 85 million years ago. This is a map by Blakely. And what we have here is North America. This is a uh, essentially a land mass with a lot of volcanoes all along it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here is Appalachia, another land mass. The Western Interior Seaway, which was connected up to the open ocean up to the north, coming down into the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf of Mexico will note that both the Florida Peninsula and the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula were drowned. So this area all through here was essentially an open shelf. It wasn't a closed basin like it is today by any means. And what we want to look at is this area right here. This is the area of the Balcones Igneous Province. They're mythic volcanoes that occurred during um, Austin chalk time in part. But this is the area of where the volcanics were. And it's also, I'm going to be talking, saying over and over again, it's an area where all the mass wasting products took place. So there's a close relationship between the two, volcanism and mass wasting. And to give you, I like to set the picture of what I'm trying to talk about instead of giving you a bunch of data, then give you one grand conclusion. I'd rather bias everyone ahead of time and say, this is what it looked like. This is a image Rod came up with of the Surtsey uh, volcano off of Southern Ireland, Ireland, Iceland, Iceland. And what we have here, we have a, a recent volcano coming up and then deep water all around it. So this could be the serpentine volcanoes or plugs within the Austin. This would be the Austin Sea out here. So if you flew over to Austin during this period of time, this is what you would see. Now get down to the regional setting. Here is um, the Austin chalk, the stratigraphic sequence right here. This is the Austin. Austin went from the upper Turonian into the lower Campanian around nine to 10 million years. These two color bars right here are ages of well-documented, um, what people call serpentine plugs or volcanoes into the Austin and also the Taylor Anacacho. <clears throat> this is based upon these dates are based upon Griffin et al. 2010 the radiometric dates. So it's pretty solid documentation. There may have been some lower in the Austin, but they have never been really encountered in core or data. So here's these periods of volcanism, and here's the one in the Austin chalk right here. It's about two and a half million years time span. So over here is South Texas um, going up into Central Texas. 
In South Texas, we've got the Maverick Basin, and that's behind the old Paleo, the Stewart, Paleo Stewart City um, Reef Trend. So the Stewart City Reef Trend has already died out and has been buried by the Upper Cretaceous Transgression. And you already had the Buda, um, Del Rio Buda in Eagerford before you got the awesome laid down. Over here is the San, area of the San Marcos Arch with maybe the jungle axis going along like this. And here's the outline of Balcones Igneous Province going through here. And I got all this out of the literature. And the red triangles are <clears throat> ideally locations of volcanic features. I've taken these data from um, Dick Be Barker and Tom Ewing in different papers. So this is just giving you an idea. There's a lot of these volcanic plugs around. And if you go into seismic, like in the Maverick County here, which I can't show, there's more volcanic um, features within this area through here. And okay, and, and here's my cross section. I'll show you a little bit. This is a core cross section based upon 12 cores through the Austin chalk that contain these, um, uh, the volcanism and uh, uh, mass debris flows. Then in the next slide, I want to show these two wells here, the Rogers well and um, a Brian well right here. These are core, or I should say, yeah, show the wells, the wireline logs. It give you a feel for the, what this stratigraphy looks like on um, wireline logs. And then I will show you another core right here. This is the uh, um, Getty core, and the Getty uh, Lloyd Hurt core. This is in a Pearsall field. This is a core that I published on in the last couple of years, which I label as a type cord well for the South Texas um, Austin chalk, because it cored the whole Austin, getting the context both the Eagleford and the um, Taylor or Anacacho up above. So taking a look at a couple of wire line, oh, let me say one more thing here. In this series through here, the Austin is about five to 600 feet thick. You go over here, it gets to about 100 feet thick. Then up on the arch here, it goes down to 50 feet thick. And out here in the Maverick Basin, where I've correlated wire line logs, it's 1,000 to 1,200 feet thick. So it thins tremendously out of the basin and up onto the arch. And take a look at a couple of wireline logs. This shows the stratigraphy. This is a stratigraphy of Tom Ewing, very nice article in the GCHS transition. It's a local nomenclature used in the Pearsall field for South Texas. And I can correlate his units all over South Texas and they pinch out or lap out onto the arch. But essentially, he divides it into five units, A, A um, excuse me, E to A through here. Um, these two things called the two fingers. These are very interesting zones. You can correlate all over the Maverick Basin. They were very eugenic times of deposition, a lot of molybdenum in it showing that they, uh, and they're also um, very source rock rich. But these are good markers in through here. The area we're interested in is the B1 zone, this area here. This is where the mass, base, mass wasting complexes are and, um, and also all the volcanic material. And you can see here, I can correlate the A and the B across into the San Mar onto at least the side of the San Marcos Arch. You can easily correlate part of the Eagleford. This is generally, they think it's more of the lower Eagleford, a little, that's a little bit of the upper part. These other units though, you can't really pick out in here. You know, I'm still debating whether they're just pinching out, blending together, or even possibly on lapping. It's very hard to correlate some of the Austin chalk, especially the upper part. So the way I wanna approach this talk is that I know not all of you are sedimentologists or carbonate geologists. I'm gonna give you some of the basics of what a chalk is and some of the critters and work up to more what the lithophages are and into the stacking patterns. So a chalk is basically made up of coccolithophores, coccolithophore just like the North Sea chalks or the chalks you see, the cliffs of Dover and whatnot. But around the SEM and all these SEM pictures I'm gonna show you, think in terms of small. These are usually micron scale features in through here. So you need the SEM to see these things. You've got to do micropetrography. You can't just do it through thin section or core. But these are coccolithos spores. They're phytoplanktonic organisms. They lived out on the shelf 
in open marine waters generally, warm stratified waters on a deeper open water shelf. They're deep water deposits, yet much of the time below storm wave beds. But you can see here, these are each, there's many shapes to these uh, coccolithosaurs, but on them you got these plates. These are called coccoliths. And when these things, and these coccoliths are held onto in their form here by mucous membrane, not cement. So when these things um, settle down through the water column, they're getting up by a bunch of organisms and then they're um, spread off fecal pellets and those sink to the bottom. And when it gets to the bottom, generally it looks like this. A bunch of coccolith hash. These are coccoliths right here. A lot of the small things in here are these pieces of coccoliths that broke up. Remember, these are not cemented. They're held together initially by just a mucous membrane. The other big player you often see out here that shows the Austin is again deep are planktic for, planktonic forams. And these are like little animals. Again, here is a um, scales. Here's a modern one with all of its uh, local, for, local pores or whatever they call them sticking out. Here's a one that's dead, but a good example one looks like there's probably a globiger in it. And so these are, um, uh, and these global drainage were symbiotic with algae in their gut. So they had to live in the photic zone. So they did photosynthesis. So they had to stay in the light zone. And generally, all the literature and the modern studies these show they lived down, they could live down to 650 feet of water depth, but generally stayed within about 300 feet of the surface. And then another larger critter, by larger again, I mean a micro scale. Um, are kelsospheres. These kelsospheres, they thought, are dinoflagellate cysts, essentially, again, a type of algae. And because they're plants, they lived in the photic zone. And they're found in abundance in the open marine conditions and are deposited by suspension in the low energy, deep water environments, just like the cocolithospheres and the um, globigerinids. And then one of the, lar the largest animal you see down in the Austin chalk are these big inothermic clams. I'm sure you've all been on field trips where you've seen these things. These can be from just a few inches across to several feet across. And these are a diagram of some modern ones. And they were very flat and thin, so they could live on muddy bottoms without sinking into the mud. Also, they had large gill areas that allowed them to survive in oxygen deficient waters. Essentially, it could be dysaerobic waters, being low oxygen, but enough that animals could live in it. And here's one from the Austin Chalk core. Note the scale here now, two centimeters. Here's one of these um clams. This is, looks like both shells are present. There's been some distortion or breakage. It's like here's three shells, and so they probably slipped, slipped over each other. <laughs> Whoops. And then here's a bunch of broken shells down here. The shell wall is very prismatic, so they break down quite easily. And the lithophases we see in in place in the Austin, there's four general ones, and this goes all the way from the Mexican border to central Louisiana. We see the same lithophages, depending where you are in the section. Lithophages one is an argillaceous marley chalk, generally very low TOC, very well burled, often vertical burled. So this is most oxic facies. Going to lithophages two, this is a very argillaceous um, burled marley chalk. So I should even actually say, yeah, marley chalk. Here, it's also well burrowed, but you can see the TLC is higher, so it's more restricted. Um, probably more disox oxid or disoxid, but all the burrows are horizontal. This is usually a sign of more restricted setting. And the other two lithophages are usually in a deeper part of the cores. It may indicate a deeper water. These are laminated. The difference between these two is this one sometimes has very small horizontal burrows in them, indicating a little bit of oxygenation, which would <clears throat> put it going from probably disoxic to anoxic. And here you've got higher TLC at 1.5 TLC. Again, in, you know, more TLC you have, the more restricted the environment in general. Here is a laminated, well laminated facies. This is little facies four. Very rare do you see a burrow in here. So that's probably very anoxic. Um, TLC is high 2%. This can go from a chalky marrow almost to the side of being not a carbonate anymore, but into a calcareous lithoclastic mudstone. And let's see. And now 
Okay, these are the building blocks essentially. Now, how do these all stack up? And um, this is now showing you the, the Getty Lloyd Hurt Corps from the Sale County. This is the wireline log. Here's the core description. This is about 500 some feet of core. And, and, and so overall, what you see in here to give you a general picture of the Austin and say in the Maverick Basin, the lower part that sees, shows all these dark lithophases, these are three and four. That shows an oxic conditions. The lighter color are one and two. So it's very cyclic. And they're probably Milankovitch cycles caused by um, orbital cycles between the sun and the earth. And so that's more of an anoxic part. You get up to the top here above the sea and it goes more oxic. You see mainly little facies one and two. These are the oxic facies. And so also is A, the same thing. But what you see in it, the ACB1, you see this, these green units. These are now the debrites. And every single core where I logged it, ACB1 in the belt, Coney's Igneous Province has these debris flows. And in the debris flows, there are volcanic, mixture of volcanic and carbonate deposits. So here's this core, the Getty core. Here is all the cores together. This is the uh, Getty core. Yeah, Getty core right here. But as you can see, going over 250 miles from the Maverick Basin, west side of the arch to the east side of the arch, you've got the B1 unit. It thins onto the arch and thickens off the arch. And you see a lot of the green in here, those are the debrites. The yellows in here are hyper-concentrated flows, another type of gravity flow. And I wanna point out right here, just one thick well here, I'll come back to the end. This thickness I think is due to a big slump slide, um, uh, which I'll come back to obviously. Okay, let's take a look at the volcanic grains. Now we just looked at the carbonate grains. And again, there's a lot of volcanoes in um, during this um, part of the Austin, may have looked like this. Here are a couple photos from Rob, where he's, he, Rob is logging a number of cores within the uh, serpentine plugs or the um, Austin chalk volcanoes. These are um, a lot of pyroclastic debris, uh, lapilli and ash. These are really large pieces here. And the difference between lapilli and ash, lapilli are these volcanic pyroclastic material that's larger than two millimeters, ash is smaller than two millimeters. Um, but here it's very massive looking. Down here, Rob and I disagree on this structure. I'll give you my opinion. I think this is a depositional dip on the size of the volcano as the ash falls and slides down. I think it have a very high angle of repose because the ash was very angular. So it could grab onto each other sort of and so get a higher angle than normal just sand. Rob thinks these are cement bands and we're still working on this discussion. So looking at the grains, we do see in the deeper water mass flows. And this is important because it's showing these mass flows were tapping into volcanic material as well as carbonate material. There's a mixture of the two. So here are some of the um, ashes and their typical pyroclastic material with um, vesicles in them, I'm filling it with cement later, typical, uh, and it's smaller than two, meter, two, meter, two millimeters, so it's an ash. And notice it's in here with um, some shallow water carbonate fauna right here. Um, and then going over here, to, okay, this is, this is actually made up, and I'll show you more details of this in a second, made up of phosphate and glauconite. It's been altered in the marine water. This ash was very prone to alteration in the marine environment. And so as soon as these things were deposited, they started to all alter, it appears to phosphate and glauconite. And, and often inside here, you have an internal oot like fabric. But here's another one of these um, ashes. This one's totally replaced by glauconite, and so is this one. Notice the irregular boundaries. But if you look really closely inside this regular boundary, you can see the old vestigos or the old gas bubbles in here, all through here. And so we see the gradation going from something like this, but when you look at it really closely, a lot of it is now glauconite and sometimes phosphate. And uh, so and we think what this glauconite, as I'm saying here, uh, the glauconite is a marine alteration of py um, pyroclast. And here's a SEM photo. Again, here 100 microns, 40 microns. Uh, this picture here is of this uh, box right in here. But here's one of these uh, 
pieces of ash. Notice the vesicle, ves, vesicles in through here. This is all glauconite. And right here, these are pyrite, filling some of the holes in here. But if you look really closely at this glauconite, it's quite interesting because it replaces the uh, volcanic ash, but also the pores are filled with a very platy glauconite. And I think a lot of the people in the Austin, when they look at the Austin on outcrop and whatnot, without having gone to the SEM, they think this is all sedimentary glauconite, but it's not. Rob and I very nicely have documented that it's an altered volcanic ash. Here's a couple more volcanic ash pictures that Rob took. This is under, again, SEM, but it's EDS, where you can do an X-ray map and get the elemental analysis. And you can see here that this, um, all through here, this is all glauconite through here. You can see the vesicle, vesicle still in, in here. And over here is another one, ash size. This is glauconite here. This is phosphate through here. And notice the, what looks like glass shards in here, and through here and here. So this is definitely, and these are glauconite again with some phosphate. And the literature documents this in other areas. But if you're a sedimentologist, you see phosphate grains in your thin section is automatically sedimentary um, glauconite, but in this case, it's not. And the other thing that's really common in all, most of the samples is, is the glauconite itself. But these glauconites are just rounded grains, maybe with a little bulbous features here and there, but they're pretty fairly rounded. Like can through here under cross necos, you can see it's definitely glauconite. And this is only occurs in, you gotta keep track of my time, only occurs in the Balcone Ignis province area. You go west of this, I've logged numerous, another 30 cores or so, it doesn't occur over there. And it doesn't occur in any other unit within the Austin going down to the Austin. So it's very closely associated with the volcanics. And, um, and also it occurs always as individual grains, often sedimentary glauconite will fill the pores or the uh, body cavities of fossils like forams and stuff. You never see this here. Again, a sign that this is not sedimentary, this is alteration of volcanics. And to show it better here, I think, here's a, one that's volcanic ashes without any questions. Here's a volcanic ash that's pure glauconite. And, and it, I think there's no question here. You can see the structures in here of the ash. Then going over to this um, sand-sized glauconite. And again, it's rounded, but inside here, if you look really closely in some of these, you can see relic structures, which I think these are more of the gas bubbles in here. And these ashes are associated with um, plantic foram indicating some deep water deposition in the background. And here is all cockroach material. <clears throat> so here, let's get to the uh, work on a depositional model here. And this um, is again, our volcano. You can think of this as one of the volcanoes in the Austin Chalk. Here's the Austin Sea, deeper water. And even today, probably in this area, you're getting possibly some cockleless on the, being deposited in here, though these waters may be a little cool. Whoops, forget about this here. Here are the stages of uh, volcanic mound development. I've taken these, I've modified these stages from another paper, sign. some of them are fairly old, especially Simons and Latrell, way back from the 60s and 70s, Roy in the 80s. Uh, Irwin has been working on the Austin Chalk off and on his volcanics over quite a long period of time. Then Michael T Tapping took a hit at it. And then Rob and I also did our own modifications. So the way we work through this is here's a stage one. You got some faulting. Tom Ewan mentions it all from 60 to 80 miles down into the crust. You got magma working up to the surface and the Austin is a mafic magma and the magma may be coming where this is coming from where the Balcones Igneous province is it's associated with the what their Wachita fold front or the front edge of it so they people think there's some stress in this area and um, it allowed magma to work its way up so it works its way up it hits into hits the water and you get this Incredible explosion of uh, magna turning the water to steam. 
So you get a big explosion here. In the early stuff, it was submarine. Uh, you got pyroclasts blowing out over an area, but obviously the submarine part being underwater limits its uh, distribution. And then it, over time, it builds up. Some of them build up above sea level, as shown here. You'd have your big mound, your talus beds going down the side with some uh, volcanic, you know, more pure volcanic ash beds down here instead of these would be more the larger pyre class and the pili. But what was interesting to Rob and me was what was the state of the Austin chalk and even the Eagleford at the time of these eruptions? Most people left it to that these were firm lithified sediments, but chalks don't lithify that fast. Chalks don't start lithifying to about 800 to 1,000 feet. And, that, and by lithifying there, it's a really weakly lithica weak lithification. And so what we think happened here, this was literally on lithified Austin. And these explosions really blew out these deep pits. These pits can be up to 500, I think 500 feet deep, these bubbles here. So, OK, so this is built up. Next thing happens and the volcano shuts down. You got atolls can build around them. These are carbonate banks. They're generating shallow water organisms such as the biota, such as red and green algae, rudis, corals, echinoids, oysters, bivalves, ostracods, bryozoans, benthic forams. And you find all these animals down here in the debris flows and hyperconcentrated flows. So this is a shallow water carbonate factory. Now when some volcanoes get eroded and go submarine, you get carbonate shows over the top, again, generating a lot of shallow water carbonate material that goes down. And I meant showing here, this is a modern analog of this mound right here. And here's our depositional model. This is, we've taken a lot of this from Luttrell, especially Pam Luttrell in 1977. This part through here, she did a thesis on the shallow water atolls around the mound, and we extended out to deeper water. But what you got here is the mound development. This is the volcanics. This could be the magma or the old magma coming up. This is the talus, pyroclastic debris, talus slopes. Um, out here, you would have a lagoon, carbonate lagoon, probably a lot of um, pyroclastic debris in here also. Then here's the atoll. It's a big shoaling complex, beach shore face complex, and going off into deeper water down to the upper slope. Then out here, which no one until Rob and I looked at this stuff recognized where these debrites or gra say gravity flows coming out. And the gravity flows like out here, these are deep water ones. Or first let me say too, come back. These gravity flows, slumps, slides, probably are related to volcanic activity because people are always saying what initiates your gravity flows or your big slump deposit. Well, here's quite easy. You've got volcanoes, you're gonna have a lot of shaking of the earth. And so, Here's some that were in much deeper water. These have very little shallow water biota. These are mud class dominated debrites. We have um, other debrites. These are made of vinosermus fragments. This is probably a deeper water one. And then you've got some that are made of a oyster fragments. These probably tap the deeper water carbonates out in this area here. They don't have other elechems in it like all the shallow water stuff I showed you. So I think these are a little deeper water. Then these hyperconcentrated flows, and I'll just say right now, these are another type of gravity flow that has not just buoyancy like a debris flow does, but it also has grain, disper grain dispersive pressure that helps hold things up. So these end up being very um, grain rich, almost packed stones to grain stones, whereas these other mud class flows and some of these others are very mud rich. And then you got supplies and slumps, but I'll go through all this as, as we work through the thing. But the important thing to remember here is that the carbonate, I mean, the volcanic induced earthquakes probably triggered the mass wasting. And these, uh, these volcanic mounds created shallow water carbonate factories where grains could be deposited in the deeper water. Okay, and then once in a while, these things blew their top, um, got big ash plumes going out, and these deposited ash beds. And we see some of these that can go for 20 miles or more, several feet, up to four or five feet thick. And I'll show you a couple of those. So I'm gonna show you um, some uh, slab photos now, but I'm gonna use this number one Velscher well um, as a type well to show you some of these. This well is located right here. 
the, the Bryant Wells here, the Velshers here, both of these are right close to a volcano as I show low in this top right here. Um, this is what it looks like on wireline log because of a lot of the carbonate in here, it gets a good SP kick. So essentially this interval through here is this, this is a thick volcanic ash. These are the background in place chalk sediments. These are probably algamated, concentrated, hyper-concentrated flows. And these are stacked debrites in through here. Hmm. Taking more time than I expected. Okay, but look at, look at the matrix of these debris flows to show that they definitely have a deep water component to it. These are SEM photos. This is a calcisphere right here. All these fine grains in here are coccolith fragments. And you can see this here once again, these are all coccolith fragments where the coccolith themselves broke apart. Here's a planktic foram. So that establishes we're dealing with deep water deposits on these debrites. So first let's take a look at some of these mud class dominated debrites. This is an example from the Velsher well. These are the two locations of these two cores. You got two types. You got soft that form um, mud class debrites, and then you got um, firm mud class debrites. And first, the soft ones. What was being eroded? We we're way out in the deep water, um, slight slope to it. But when the, the um, earthquake triggered a flow, what it activated was mud class. And these mud class were very soft. And the one thing about uh, debris flows, they can, because they are movement by carrying their stuff by buoyancy, they can carry very soft, delicate material without totally destroying it. And this is what you see in here, because these are soft mud class. There's some deformation of the mud class into here. The edges seem um, smeared out in some cases through here. So this was soft. Here you get another type. This may be further up the slope where the sediment was buried more down like 30. 40 feet and it got discovered back out on the slopes. And they, these are all mud class, but much firmer. And you can see they carry relic burrows in them. They're firm enough to keep the burrows without being destroyed. And you can see in between here, this is um, the debris flow matrix with soft class in here, filled with um, glauconite, which are volcanic um, flow material. And these burrows here, I reorient and I point that out because if this was just say a firm ground or something, you think you would think of all the burrows being on top, not being tilted over or, or down as you here. And the thin sections of these show mixtures of um, uh, deeper water planktic forams, uh, calcisphere's, the matrix of coccolith fragments. So this is deep water. These are from these cores here. You got some shallow here. This one you got some shallow water components by some of the volcanic glauconite grains some plaintic forams in here. So a mixture of shallow and deep water fauna and um, an acocalypse thing. But now take a look at a couple other type of deep debris flows. These are the grain dominated type. First, okay, here we're gonna use two other wells, the Lloyd Hurt well, way down in LaSalle County. But this one, all the dark material in the background here is the glauconite. That's forming a lot of the matrix through here. But you see some soft mud class in here. But you, it needs you to get a lot of inosermis fragments, um, especially smaller pieces that's hard to see in the core. And you also get some lithoclasts being eroded down. These were hard substrates, submarine hard grounds that got ripped up and deposited going down. And then, and I think these, because of all the dominated by um, inosermis, I think they're deeper down on the ship, down the slope near the bottom in deeper water where inosermis live. Here is one that's dominated by this articulated oyster, essentially half shells of oysters. These never went, these are shallower water organisms, but they never went through any sort of abrasive process. It looks like they got activated up higher on the mounds, but, but a little deeper than the atoll itself, and they got washed down. And so there's no abrasion to these. They're just in this carbonate mud matrix. And by carbonate mud, I mean coccolith fragments, basically, with some argillaceous material. <clears throat> Okay, the next one, uh, the hyper-concentrated density flow. Again, these are interesting because these are the ones most rich in the shallow water biota, but definitely mixed with um, the deep water biota and, and where we got them some really good uh, um, 
volcanic ash, like I've shown you. But these, I think, tapped right into the atoll itself where you had your shallow water components because they're so grain rich and they got so much shallow water components in them. By hyper concentrated flows again, okay, let me just say the debris flows are done by buoyancy, cohesive flows. These are non cohesive flows, the hyper concentrated one. They got buoyancy plus dispersive pressure, like grain to grain contact or, or, or pushing each other apart. So these generally don't transport too delicate, too delicate things down that are large. But these are what they look like. This is down here. The yellow here is a glauconetic rich hyper concentrated uh, density flow. They're generally massive in sandstones or carbonates. Some people call them flexoturbidites and other things like that. But this is a classic um, hyper concentrated density flow. And I'll show you a thin section of them in a minute. But a couple of them get weird on me. The background looks just like a dent, one of these hyperconcentrated density flows, but they picked up a couple large class. And these class are cemented. So again, I think, and these class are made of a, a shallow water biota. There's even some bivalve shells attached to some of these class. I mean, so these are essentially stein kerns inside the class. And then you also got Ino cermid. So this is probably some um, early lithification. Uh, maybe beach rock material or whatever that's getting caught up in these um, uh, hyper concentrated flows and being brought down. And a thin section here, microns again, all of them are a couple hundred microns. Is fine. These are the shallow water organisms. These are red algae, which need light to survive. And they're mixed very nicely with planktic forams, uh, the echo echinoid or echinoderm deposits. These are benthic forams right here. And these are deep water lithoclasts. So as these things come roaring down the slope, they're ripping up mud and incorporating the mud into the uh, into these uh, hyper concentrated flows. Over here, we got a coral. We got um, a bryozoan up in through here, planktic forams, bivalve fragments, more red algae again, showing a good mixture of shallow and deep. Here we got a very nice piece of volcanic ash, uh, red algae. Um, showing a mixture of volcanic and bivalve fragments. And over here, all this strange looking material, this is an oyster right here, but all the strange material in back, this is all volcanic ash of some type. And these are inocermid fragments. So again, mixture of shallow, deep water stuff with volcanics. And then volcanic ash beds. Whoops, okay. Didn't mean to run through that, but here's our volcanic ash bed. And what do they look like? Here's a very good one. I think this is an ash fall. This is out of the Belcher. It's very close to a known volcanic plug or mound. And it's now altered to clay. Uh, these are carbonate fractures through here. They call it carbonate calcite beef, but it's a diagenetic feature. This is essentially a five foot clay right here. And it correlates between this and the the By Byron well, which is uh, 15 miles away to another ash bed, I'll show you in a minute. But this is an ash bed and thin sections of these um, ash bed type things, you get uh, relic glass shards in them, just like you'd expect. Here, here they're replaced by calcite. In this uh, sample here, they're replaced by clay. These are all glass shards, all in the ash range. And the volcanic ash, um, besides ash falls, there's also what I think are volcanic um, ash flows. The stuff was deposited. It's unstable on these mound slopes, which are about five degrees, but that's really quite high for a slope. And any triggering of a volcano, earthquake by a volcano is going to make this stuff move. This is equipped, this ash bed here is out of the Byron well. It's the same ash bed or same unit as this. Whoops. But I think this one was remobilized and redeposited more like a, a hyper concentrated flow. It's very massive. It doesn't have all the clay material in here. So this is a different um, uh, type of deposit. I think it partly is because it's a flow which was generated by an ash bed being remobilized. Remember what these ashes are deposited too. They're probably at a high angle repose and can be easily moved again. And this one here, this is dominated by ash again. It's very clay rich. 
You see some oyster shells in here, uh, some inosurmic fragments, but basically it's volcanic ash and it's got a very nice scour surface down here. And down here in this Austin chart, you've got some nice new ficus burrows, deep water. So we're nowhere deep water here for sure. But what you see in here is probably another volcanic ash that deposited on the mound, got reactivated by an earthquake. Is it flow down? It picked up inosurmic fragments, oyster fragments, and some uh, sediment class. So that's a very nice ash flow after deposition. Here is a very nice debrite with the mud class in it again, same up on top here. What you got in between it, there was a very thin um, mudstone bed. Most of us, myself, when I first started logging the Austin, I just thought these were mud plumes or something, you know, more depositional mud coming from the continent or somewhere else. But I've come to the conclusion, very little continental material gets out this far into the Austin shelf. This is over 100 miles from the nearest land mass. <clears throat> and for other reasons, I think, well, whatever. So this is, I think, is an ash fall or a remobilized um, ash flow. But again, a lot of these things that just look like clay layers in here are probably ash beds. They don't line up. When you hit them with UV light, they don't line up, light up like the uh, Austin, the Eagleford ones do. So it doesn't make them that easy to spot. And they take a lot of work to work in every one of them to document them. And getting near the end here, I want to show you one more feature. And this is the um, uh, slump and slide. And this particular well here, you know, it's, it's extra thick. This is the laminated anoxic Austin here. But I'm going to show you, this is a, about a 45 foot slump and slide. So I think with this slid, it created evacuated space above it that gave you this thicker zone of the Austin B1. And because this is probably the Austin um, C, D, and E or some combination of them. But here is that unit, this deeper unit right down here. And you can see in the core, you got a lot of folding. Um, you got some micro faults in here. It's just, and, um, and shearing. So this is typical of a big thick slide. It didn't break up into smaller pieces or anything like that. It just slid down and everything got contorted. Over here, you had more shearing, some break up part of the bed. If you really play with this, you can convince yourself this might be a recumbent fold in here. So slumping, this is a very thick one. Generally, the slumps and slides in here are only a couple feet thick or less. And the final thing that starts summing up, this is a stacking pattern through the Byron well, this is again, right near the Velcher well. This is what, just a very nice uh, core to show the uh, correlation or the relationship between volcanics and mass wasting deposit. Again, you got um, some debrites down here. Here's a beautiful volcanic ash, um, more debrites, hyper concentrated flows. This is pretty thick. And I think it's algamated, more flows, more in place Austin. And this is proximal to a mound. You get away from the mounds, you don't see the hyper-concentrated flows anymore. So conclusion-wise, volcanic activity was common in the Austin Chalk B1 unit, and only that unit, on a, a large regional basis. Um, and it was during, this was all happening during the rest of the Austin between Mexico and Louisiana, it was deeper water deposition. Volcanic mounds created shallow water settings in the photic zone that supported carbonate factories. These shallow water carbonate factories generated carbonate sediment to form parts of the mass wasting deposits on the deeper Austin chalk platform. We postulate that earthquakes associate, associate with the volcan volcanoes trigger gravity flow, flows and slumps. Thank you. Still there, Linda? Oh, uh oh, oh. Your mic is off, Linda. Thank you, Bob. Yes, I'm still here. Sorry about that. You, you just panicked me. I, I was worried if my <laughs> mic was off this whole time. <laughs> no, uh, after all this time on Zoom, somehow it's like you're muted still challenges me. Sorry. <laughs> that was a great talk. Wow. I, okay, you know, thank you. I encourage people to ask questions uh, in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I, I'm trying to. Do we have anybody who has a question? No. 
No pun in the chat. <laughs> oh, John, go ahead and go with it. Go for it. Well, um, I was wondering if um, Bob had any thoughts about the why the volcanism was so short lived when it's a um, really hype abyssal, very, very deep volcanism. Uh, the, you know, the, that, that's a that's a great question, and that's why Rob's here. <laughs> oh, Rob. <laughs> what do you mean by what do you mean by short lived? Um, well, a couple of million years. Yeah. That's yeah. It, that's the age. It, it, if I may also add, why did it break why did it stop during the Austin A unit that start again up in the uh yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Um I have if to, you want. I have to say that uh, that's the age dates they've got so far. Uh, probably all the age dates they're ever going to get. But uh, this is some very strange volcanism. Some there, there isn't a really good modern analog. So it's kind of hard to make too much out of it. Uh, you know, it did occur. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but Rob's about more the volcanic expert than me. But it is coincidental that it does occur along the Washita front, and that's what people related to. And I'm not sure if it's some sort of a stress release or something. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have an idea? Okay. Oh, could you excuse me? I'm going to just stop the recording. Uh, and I hope that encourages more questions. Let me just do that real quick. Let's see. Where is it? I, we do have a couple more questions, but 